I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we now meet. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. I also pay my respect to all Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islander of Australia and hope that the path towards reconciliation continues to be shared and embraced. So the agenda for today is uh, to briefly introduce early career. Then we will invite our guest speakers to share tips on writing and early career applications, reminders on the nomination key date, and lastly, Q&A session. To be eligible for early career, nominees were to have no more than five years experience teaching in higher education. That is from the starting date of teaching to the date of submissions. We understand that there'll be some disruptions and uh, you can always email the awards team in regards to calculation of the five years period. And for early career applications, nominees to make a case that they have positively impacted on student learning, student engagement, or the overall student experience for a period of no less than two years for early career. And if you are applying for citations, you have to select one of the four criteria. And if you are applying for teaching awards, you will have to address all four criteria. So we are very much en encouraging the pathway, getting the citations and then moving forward to teaching here. So today we are delighted to have the 2018 and 2019 early career recipients to share their tips on writing an early career application. What are some of the challenges they face during the applications writing and how they overcome it? So let's welcome Dr. Demelzer from Uni of Western Australia and Associate Professor Christian Morrow from Bond University. Well, welcome everyone. I am here on the lands of the Wajak Noongar people in Perth and I pay my respects to our elders over this side of the country. Um, thank you for having me, Angeline and Jing, to share my experience. I won the Early Career Award in 2019. I have had such a great experience since then. I am a senior lecturer now in the School of Biomedical Sciences at UWA, teaching infection and immunity and women's health. Go, Hello, I'm Christian. I'm a scientist, so a laboratory-based scientist in physiology, and I'm at Bond University on the Gold Coast. And it's great to be here. It's been a fun journey, you know. I really, I really, really like these awards. I, I'm so like thankful that we have them. It's been great to reflect upon teaching and looking forward to, to going through some of the little tips we have with you. Could you share with us your tips in addressing the early career assessment? Because that is slightly different from the other category. Tell us a bit more about how to go about addressing the assessment criteria, uh, gathering evidence. Yes, yeah, so I'll go through a bit of this now. Um, I've been a little bit fortunate in the fact that I've done not only applied for a few few different awards now, but also was an assessor for the AUT and a mentor for a couple of years now, I listed on the website. So I've seen a lot of applications and it's been, I guess the first thing to talk about is the fact that it's sort of, it's not about us as individuals, but it's about teaching excellence. And this is one thing that I see a lot. People will, will be writing in and having fantastic careers. You know, I was valedictorian of Oxford University which is great, but it, okay, but how does that link to teaching? It's an award about teaching excellence, not about you or us. It doesn't mean that shouldn't go in there, and it should, but it's thinking about how do we link that information with teaching? I was valedictorian of Oxford University, and working in this high competitive environment has taught me skills and tactics that I then use in my teaching. It's, it's little, little add-ons at the end, but that, that's the most important thing. There's a couple of things, I guess, that when you see the applications at the level of, of Teaching Excellence Award, Early Career and, and the others, are these are already, we know you're a fantastic teacher. The evaluations are great. Everything's good and you've got great backgrounds, but it's showing us how that can be transformed or that, that background can be linked to teaching and learning. Well, learning and teaching, let's put learning first. Yeah. And that's, that I guess is, is one major thing that the first thing I always see is very much about the candidate rather than about the students. And the experiences are fantastic, but linking the experiences, the achievements, the beneficial processes of your life and your career, work in industry and linking that into the classroom. And when you read it well, it's the same content, little lines here and there that you start reading the applications and thinking, wow, this uh, the students are lucky to have this person rather than, wow, this person's great. It's just a, a slight different way of, of framing the content. So that's my second point there. How does your background benefit students? And then how do you draw on those experiences to facilitate learning in an enhanced way? And that's where it really starts to stand out. So thinking about you know, making sure you're promoting the background. And I mean, one of the criteria is that command of the field. 
you're talking about it, but it's it's command of the field you know, in relation to teaching. I find that my students very rarely ask me about my research. I'd love they, I'd love it if they did, <laughs> if they asked us more often. But they very rarely come up and ask about my. I mean, I do urinary bladder pharmacology and physiology, and they don't ask about it. And yet, it's an important part of my teaching. So making sure the application shows how you're linking that research to advance and help the students rather than just showcasing citations and research. So that, I guess, is is the first thing that I've noticed consistently is as much about the applicant, but how it links to the teacher. You tend to find these applications and the ones that I'm mentoring littered with a lot of endeavours, which not that someone's gone rogue, but come across as, you know, I tried this and tried this and I had students you know, people from the industry come in and talk in our classes, but then no evidence as to whether that was good or not. So rogue's a bit of a strong word on purpose, just to be a little bit facetious there. But it's if, if you're linking with industry, showing how that works, are these students better equipped then to get a job and how do we show it? How are they link? you know, how are we linking these in? So lots and lots of activities fill these awards. But the big question is, well, was it good? Did it work? Rather than just I'm out, you know, collecting people from industry to talk in my class, I'm out trying to help the just same how you frame it helping the students having people in are they taking interns are they helping you know what's the actual evidence so making sure that any intervention has evidence in the literature or evidence in what you're doing or even some sort of positive feedback rather than just students saying they liked it but how can we show that the interventions aren't just you trying different things and hoping they work they're actually things that are work so I'll go into some evidence that we can get for that the other one then drawing on scholarly scholarly literature and doing your own research I know it's cliche but we see very I, I know the ones that I've mentored and seen and even been on the assessor and the first few ones that I wrote for like the citation were very limited in regards to the the scholarship so we we know we're meant to do it but it doesn't appear as much as as you'd expect so Thinking about that, are you drawing upon you know, work or how is it varied from the scholarship? Other words then, the cliche words that I use a lot of and we all use a lot of, um, you know, things like engage, um, effective, enhanced learning. Yeah, these are all measurable metrics. So the students were engaged, okay, but how? Rather than just saying that, is it behavioural engagement? Are they spending more time on tasks? These are measurable metrics, which we overuse a little bit. But in regards to something like that, over the last two years and beyond, um, if you don't for an extra year or so, how have you, you know, how are you showing engagement? They're keywords we overuse, but it's something, think about the evidence. And think about now, if you genuinely have, in, have, have put students into a situation or a lab or an activity where they're far more engaged, start thinking about how can I measure that? How can I show they're more engaged? What's engagement? How does it work? How are we enhancing learning? Is it enhancing learning by exam results or by other things or pre-post quizzes? Thinking about how to do it because saying, you know, my interventions have engaged students and enhanced learning will be in everyone's application, but the evidence isn't always there to show why. And then other ones, um, consider some of the interventions and activities are things that we should be doing anyway. You know, so it's teaching excellence. If you have an, I mean, reviewing an assignments criteria sheet every semester and tweaking it, you know, to make it sort of more suitable or responding to student evaluations is something we all do anyway. So are you doing something different in that? How is it making you stand out from the others? Is something useful as well? So, you know, and the thing is applying for this award, you are doing things that are better. So how are you doing more than just the expectation of tweaking a criteria sheet? You'd expect to see things like student evaluations and peer reviews and that sort of thing in it. So I had to look through my applications and I thought, what are some other ones that I've put in, which I wouldn't have thought of the first year out? You know, that, um, and one of them, I guess, was live class attendance. I use that phrase, students vote with their feet. When the lecture is recorded and students still want to turn up and they still want to watch and engage, it's showing that your hands-on activities are being valued more than just the content you're providing. I guess if they don't show up, then you can also then argue that that's showing that your online content is great. So it's just packaging what's happening. But for me, I like to run that hands-on interactive live activities, which means having the students there is showing that they are valuing that. So I do track attendance at all my sessions, even though... You, know, you don't have to formally. I like to know who's there and who's not. And it also actually helps you pick up any students at risk. Wow, well, you haven't come to any lectures this week and knowing who they are. So little ones like that, even that interactions with your online platform. If every student is logging on every single week and clicking and adding things and doing optional activities and little quizzes and things, you can track all of that in learning management software. And it shows that students are engaging. That's one thing that does show that. Things like interactions with the online platform, I'm just other ones, views, clicks, articles, submissions, and content. If you are doing, you know, blogs or information, I use Instagram a lot, physiology with Christian. So I use Instagram with my students, but showing things like if you make a YouTube video, are all the students watching it two or three times? That matters. You can actually track minutes watched in YouTube. And you can say, you know, in a class of 100 students, each one has watched at least 100 minutes of that video, which means they all watched it twice or three times. So these are little metrics 
that are above and beyond the others that are very, very easy to find and do show that your content is being recognized and an importance being placed on them. And it matters because students nowadays are, are getting so much content online, so many videos, you know, every class, and I've noticed this, every class is providing videos and content and practice questions and and the students will do what they value. And our students at the moment keep using words like high yield, low yield. That's low, you're not going to do that. That's high yield. I don't like those terms at all. It's all it's, it's all important. But it's the students are doing that. And it's showing that there is an importance placed on your content because they are spending time on it. They are doing it. So keep an eye on that. Other ones there, peer review feedback. I had a I had a semester where every week I had an, a, a high level, like a sort of past awarded staff in my class helping me out because I wanted to get that semester right. I love peer review. I, I used to be a school teacher and I'm used to having student teachers in the class or when, you know, your first couple of years having another teacher in the class. I'm just used to that, always getting some feedback. You get it from the students, but I find peer review is really useful. And then how you use that feedback rather than just saying I engage in peer review, how are you using that? Solving community problems. This is one thing that, that helps actually. And trying to work out why are we doing the interventions. For me, for example, I do a lot of critical thinking in my classes and I do it because in medicine, the current suggestion is that every 73 days, the amount of medical information doubles around the world. So you've got these huge numbers of publications and not knowledge, but information being exploded around the world. Everyone's publishing a lot more than they used to be and this is all stacking. So we're having this doubling and doubling and doubling of medical information out there and helping the students work out what actually matters. And that's an important skill. We're not able to teach everything. So, you know, that, that's an example of a of a problem that I've worked out. These students are coming where there's huge amounts and wealths of inf a wealth of information. Uh, how can they work out the right stuff, the evidence base, what matters? And I think that's important for them in their future skills. And so that's why that content is in there rather than just, I thought it was important. There's a problem, try to solve it, prepare students for the future, that kind of thing. It's just how we frame it. Graduate feedback's been great. You know, you'll often, oh, not, oh, not that often. I wish it was more often, but sometimes you'll have students, especially in medicine, we'll, we'll see you at Woolworths and come over and say, you know, oh, Christian, I really, you know, the other day I was thinking about you. I was with a patient and this thing came up and I thought about your lecture and how it helped and how relevant that was. You know, the correct response there is, thank you. Can I get that in writing? <laughs> it's always the correct. <laughs> um, but it's that sort of thing that hearing from graduates saying that, oh, I thought about your session the other day, that it is actually impactful. And that's something that I haven't done much of. We focus on the current students. Um, and there are things that we teach, statistics and research analysis, that students don't like, they don't get it, but they, they get it later. And that matters then. I now see what all those sessions were about. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Is It means a lot. So don't forget about the graduates. Um, they're always around going to graduate events and saying, can you please send me an email with <laughs> anything you thought might have been useful is, is worthwhile. And it also helps us realize what the graduates um, value. And really that effective stewardship of grant money. That, that's another thing. If you get any other awards. So, you know, if you have any other money showing that you've used that really effectively, that it's something that any income or small grants or even seed grants from the faculty showing how that money gets used to enhance teaching is quite a nice little I guess, selfless way to, to get a bit of evidence. So what have you done with past awards and monies? And I've bought VR sets here that a lot that then more students can involve themselves in sort of self-directed learning when we're not in the class. So little things that they can do and then benefits beyond the institution, as we know, those sort of things are in there. And who else is following your example? That's where citations might come in. I've got a lot of citations on my articles. Okay, but but is, is that what, what you're showing is others are following your example or you're making an impact. So getting back to that, to that yes it's great metrics but why what does it show and what does it mean and then how long in the future will these interventions maintain benefits or something else so you know rather than just teaching the students for today back to that graduate we're preparing them for life and how you're doing that and how you know that and that's when you can bring in more of those ex experiences from the past i guess for the for the tlos as well it, these take they take ages to write and you know we're all involved in the university is involved the staff are involved the person's involved they take months it took me you know a year to collect the, the evidence alone and so it's only one can be given out a year and this is where it's sort of in the in the early career so thinking about when you're writing it how can we also use this in the future if you are or you're not successful rather than just having yep i got it let's leave that thinking about what are some benefits of going through this process and that's what i've enjoyed the most out of it actually is you've now got an updated CV, for example. You've now got evidence you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. You've then used the evaluation strategies to enhance your class teaching, not just to say you have, but actually, look, if we get the award or not, it, it you know, it's nice to get it, but if you don't, it doesn't matter because I've had a good year or two of reflection and thinking and evaluation and adjusting my class to make sure it's the best I can do it. So 
this is something that can be really positive, that it's not just about going for the award. It's thinking, okay, well, there's a lot of time invested in this. If I don't get it, is it still worth it? And it genuinely can be. And reflection really helps in that sort of thing. So thinking from the start, I want to reflect upon my teaching. I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing for students. The criteria are very good in regards to that and collecting evidence. And even though there must be the same, and we can't apply for the award anymore now, you know, we're locked out, but I still use all that evidence and I'm still collecting it uh, because it helps our teaching. And I learned a lot of skills from going through this process. So that's just something else that there's benefits aside from just the award. There's benefits of reflecting and doing it and doing it right. And also working with the university. Thanks. That's my little tips. And we'll have a a little chat at the end. Thank you, Christian. And it's really good to know that besides thinking beyond applying for the awards and for the personal development of individuals as well. Demelza, over to you. Thank you, Jin. Thank you, Christian, for a very thorough introduction. Your list of uh, of evidence is super helpful. And I found when I first started putting together my application and I was confronted with a list of all the possible types of evidence I could use, that at first I thought that was a little overwhelming but I have a little model that I'm hoping I can share and that it will be helpful to you as you put all of that examples of evidence together that Christian has just shared. Um, But before I do that, I want to touch on a couple of the things that Christian said that sprung to mind and sort of sent me reflecting on my early experience putting together my application. And one of the things that Angeline asked us to talk about was addressing the criteria specifically as an early career person. And I found when I was putting mine together that I had strong evidence in a couple of the criteria. I knew I could hit the approaches to teaching pretty well, and I knew I could hit the development of curricula pretty well, but I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to hit the assessment or evaluation number three and the leadership and scholarship at the bottom. And it took a little bit of time to get my head around the fact that at an early career level, we can demonstrate some emerging skills in this area, that we at least have a developmental plan towards hitting these goals in the future. So I think my first tip as an early career person is make sure you hit criteria one and two really well. Um, But if you get to the third and fourth one and feel like you're not quite going to hit enough points, think really hard about what it is that you're doing to demonstrate an emerging, you know, skill set in these two. And I think you'll find that you will get enough meat in the sandwich to fill in your application. The other little tip I had was around the use of scholarship and Christian talked about how important it is and he's clearly published a few papers which I haven't yet done in the education space you know it would be wonderful if we all had publications resulting from our wonderful teaching but as an early career person that you know might be a long shot for some of us to have that I think the other thing is that as an t- early educator, we haven't often been trained in education. I know I started my graduate certificate in tertiary teaching about three years into my teaching. And so my first few years were done by gut. It was done by, you know, w- what it was that I enjoyed as a student, what I think the students will get a lot of benefit out of. What I then learned as, you know, I had to remind myself that I am a scientist and I can be led by the evidence was I started to go back to the literature and try to fill in the gaps in my knowledge. Why is it that I'm doing this thing and why is it that it feels right? Here is some wonderful work that describes the theory behind why whatever it is that I'm doing works. And so I wasn't afraid in my application to say I did this thing because it felt right. I now know that it's called social constructivism and then demonstrate that I have I can now use the theory to back me up. And I find after learning in reverse, I suppose, how to use the evidence from the literature, I now go there more more early in my questioning about a new practice. I will tend to use the literature more. And I've started little journal clubs in our school around the scholarship of teaching and learning to help get us towards the language. I think that's the other final tip for an early career person. Your reviewers do want to see some of the language of the scholarship of teaching and learning. And as a biomedical scientist, I had no idea what social constructivism was or authentic learning. And so I had to get my head around that language. And that comes from then reading the literature as well. I think that's the first tip, that we can be fearful of this lack of language, scared that we haven't used the scholarship yet. 
I encourage you to try it and to demonstrate it and then you'll find it becomes more natural into the future. So they're my first three tips about being early career. Let's talk about my little model. Now, this isn't my model. This is a model that was given to me when I was putting my application together by a wonderful person, Dr. Kristen War-Peterson from UTAS. She did some little workshops with us at UWA as we we're putting together our applications. I'm calling it the triangle model. I don't think Kristen actually had a word for it, but this is how she described a really great approach to putting the application together. And I certainly used it and I had sticky notes all over my office walls as I was modelling this thing together. And I hope that it might be helpful for you too. The advice I got from Kristen was that for each of the criteria, you should have three examples of how you hit it. So for approaches to teaching and learning, and I'm going to show you my model on the next slide, have three good ways that you've hit that. And for each of the three examples, try and find three pieces of evidence to demonstrate how you've achieved that and to try to get those three pieces of evidence from a different source. So here's my little model. This is how I described hitting cr criteria number two around the development of curriculum and resources. So in triangle one at the top, I developed a series of broadening units in women's health. So I described the genesis of these units, what they, how they were made, why I approached it in the particular way I did. And then I found three pieces of evidence. So I had student enrolments over time that increased. I had a tutor recommendation for an award. I had a solicited letter from a guest lecturer. Then I looked at, I consolidated immunology teaching at level three. I merged two units together. I identified a need to squish these things together because it would be more effective for our school. And so what were my three bits of evidence to support that? I had feedback from a line manager. I had student evaluations before and after the change. And I had a thank you card from the cohort who was taking two immunology units at level three in one semester, thanking me for making it just one. Three different types of evidence there. And then the third one was I contributed to the renewal in our MD program. Here I had three bits of information too. An in-class survey on a new activity I introduced. Medical students wrote a big evaluation report through their society and it referenced what I'd been doing so I could use that and then there was an unsolicited email from a lecturer so you can see here that these all hit the point of how I developed or reviewed curriculum and resources but each one has three evidence piece of evidence and that each of them come from a different source so I, what I did as I, I I had sticky notes of different colors and I put them all on my wall with all of the ideas I had and then workshopped them around this triangle model until I felt that I had a really rich application and you could quickly see where you were missing a gap in the middle. That took a lot of time and then I still had to write the application but this has just highlighted as Christian said how important it is to be collecting a diverse set of evidence and to maintain a log. Now I would love to say I'm organised enough to have a folder on my computer where I put every email I receive or a scan of every thank you note but I don't. I have to go back into my email and search for stupid words like thank you to try and find my evidence. So if you are organised and you save that stuff routinely it would do you a wonderful benefit into the future. I wanted to finish off on that point of, you know, it can be challenging to put this together. And Christian also touched on that it is quite a time consuming process. And that was my experience as well. But again, I want to remind you of the real benefits for that. Christian reminded you of the benefits around improving your own teaching and learning, filling out your CV so you're prepared if you need it. But for me, there were three key things that came directly out of that application. I reworked it and reused it to apply for early release from my tenure probation. I reworked it and used it to apply for promotion. And I'm using it now for an application for senior fellowship to the Higher Education Academy. So getting all of this together, working to those four criteria that you will see are consistent across a number of different platforms and application processes will really set you up well into the future. That's my last tip. I'm happy to take questions and I think Christian is too. Thank you, Christian and Demelza. Before we move to questions, is there any encouraging words that you have for anyone that is watching right now and they're yep. thinking, I know about all this, should I, <laughs> should I not be applying for early career applications? What are some of the encouraging words that you have for them? I've got a really quick one. It is 
just to have belief in the person who believed in you to nominate you, to mobilise a student in the first instance to nominate you for a faculty or school award, wherever it was that you started this journey, is an immense achievement to mobilise a student to, to nominate you. Um, to get through this process, for the university to put you up for this award is because they really believe in you. They wouldn't do it otherwise. So whilst we might have that imposter syndrome feeling sometimes, I say, you know, just go for it. You'll be so proud at the end. You know, whatever the outcome, the reward is, is wonderful. So believe in yourself and believe in who nominated you and just do it. I learned a lot. I, and I learned a lot about reflecting upon my teaching and I also learned that some of the things I weren't doing weren't work. I was doing weren't working. Yeah. Um, you know, I was giving all these students virtual reality and loving it and it was working in some cases, but when you really get down to it, some students said, look, I want to I want to make notes while I learn and I can't in this device. And you start getting some really positive feedback that you wouldn't have sought otherwise. And, you know, now I use a lot of things sparingly and I'm much more careful with how I add things to classes. So I, I found the process really reflecting and considering the yeah what you're doing was really beneficial and mm. only because the criteria was so descriptive you know how are you using assessment and evaluation to mm. oh that's actually a, okay well I'm not really doing that so what does that when you first look at it what does that even mean and learning that and now realizing when I'm not doing things so I guess it's a holistic way to look at your teaching mm. um, in a really positive light so I learned a lot from it so I definitely apply because yeah and the more that you feel like you don't meet those criteria, the better it is because you learn, well, what, how do I meet it? And now I do feel better equipped to use things like assessment and evaluation in my teaching than I wouldn't have otherwise. Mm. So it's it's mm. a good insight, not just to what you're really good at, because the citation, you get one of the four criteria, what are you really good at? And the other ones, you know, they're already your weakest ones, just if you've gone for the citation before, but that's that's a big part of it. Let's try mm. and where mm. are we weak and what can we learn? Agreed. I think the other tip, Angeline, is to develop the narrative, to really think about, you know, there is a risk that your application will just read like a long CV full of things that you do. But as Christian started with, you know, filling in the gap of why did you do that and what was the impact and developing that narrative around your achievements, I think is really important and really rewarding experience too. This reflective writing, that's quite a skill. That, that you know, am I using all of my uh, like research and things in teaching and how? How could I do it? How yeah. could I use it more? How could I do it better? And that little thing. So, I, yeah, and I think also when something doesn't work, that's a wonderful thing to write in. Why didn't, why did you do it? Why did you feel it didn't work? What did you learn from it and where are you going to next? I think sometimes we hide our little failures away. Um, I actually highlighted several of mine to show growth and development and where I then source the literature to support a change. So yeah, the little things that didn't work are actually great fodder for this. Mm. If you sell them the right way, if you develop that narrative, yeah. And you do see that. You'll see the people giving t like evaluation tables which skip a year or two. Why did you skip yeah. it? Get, tell, show us. Show, yeah. You can have, you know, um, it's fine and it's good and it yeah. shows that you're working yeah. with it. Thank you, Christian Demarza. That is, I think, the first hurdle that we have to overcome is always the fear, isn't it, that is holding us back. So it's sort of like be bold and step forward. Oh, no, in addition to what Christian and Demarza has shared, another good reason to apply right now is the uncertainty of the awards moving forward with the government cut next year we don't know what is happening in that space now is a good chance to put in your applications just give it a go and especially we want to encourage more women applicants as well the so christian and demelza has by receiving this award actually impacted on your career so what happened, you know, in a nutshell, after receiving this award, how has it actually opened up opportunities for you? Look, there's been a few. One, of, I guess, is because I, I had a really updated uh, resume, you know, which was great, actually. Uh, and that's one thing that your CV and your your teaching portfolios and things really help. And it sounds like what Demelza said, for, for promotions, um, for applications, for other awards, it's really useful. I went on from this one to then I applied and won the Australian Financial Review Higher Education Award, which is a great industry award still running. I really hope these ones keep going because I do. I'm so thankful that the AUT one's here. But um, to move on to the AFR Award, um, I received that. I then got a Physiology Society Award, which was helpful. But, you know, based on the same evidence, different applications, but you've got that evidence now. All of a sudden you have this and you're constantly improving. 
Um, I then this year went on and won the Reimagine Education Award, so the, the old Wharton Awards, the Reimagine Education Award, um, which was great actually, and that that's now sort of going to an international level. But but it takes you know, having that early career start, really early in my career, and getting that evidence is actually I don't think I would have had anything nearby, anything near what I have now if I hadn't gone for it. Um, so it's been a really good journey, but it all kind of started in that right. Let's start looking at it, making the teaching as good as I can be. And then continue to develop from that. So it's been a nice run, actually. It's been it's been fun, and I'm still learning, though. I'm still learning. Yeah, I've had a wonderful experience to Angeline since winning the award. You can see some of the achievements there on the screen. For me, I I have I think the net my network has grown enormously. Um, within my school, I've um, you know more people have see who I am and what I'm up to, and they call on me for advice. Which you know these are professors that taught me, and now I'm teaching them, which is you know a really lovely experience. Um, but then within the university, I've had opportunities to join university level working parties and committees to get a greater sense of how higher education works. Um, then uh, nationally as well, doing things like this and other little webinars that I've been involved with um, that may, means I meet new people. I feel really confident now to message Christian if I ever need him. You know, I think that's one of the great things. It's, it fills in gaps. It brings you together. You do become a little, you know, this you, do, you have this network feel within AAUT that they look after you. Um, that's really nice. All right. Thank you, Christian and Demelza. And uh, if you're interested to hear more, they have actually produced videos sharing their journey. Hello. Thank you for this um, tremendously um, interesting and useful session. It's been fantastic. And I've got so many tips written down now. So it's Yay. been really wonderful. Um, I have a question um, that might be a question for that rep um, represents other people in the room as well. Um, so I am categorized as early career, but the first like three and a half years of my teaching career have been sessional. And so I haven't had a huge amount of consistency. Like I haven't spent five years working in one program or even in one discipline. I've sort of been moving within my department and then without my department as well. Um, and I have a theme in mind for myself that um, has sort of guided my teaching throughout these five years. But it's not clear in a resume sense what that is just because I've taken taught so many different units in so many different places. So I was wondering about sort of your tips for um, sort of bringing that story together. Alex, congratulations that you have a story in mind because I think that's the hard part to start on. And I think that's perfect for this. This award application shouldn't read like a CV. It should read more like a story of your evolution and what you've given back and what your students got from it. And so I don't think it needs to be chronological or it needs to be, you know, tick boxes in a particular order. I think drawing on all of your experiences is um, will work just fine. That's my thought. But Christian's read many more than me. No, I think the same. It doesn't need to be chronological. It's, you know, over the, the application that says over two years, but evidence that things that you're doing is working. In fact, it's much harder to pop into a to a sort of class and do something effective than it is to sort of run it consistently. So it's showing how you can react with students that, yeah. um, you know, build a rapport quickly without over a long period of time. It's, it's a whole different skill. And if you're doing it well, it's it's admirable. So no one will look at that and say, no, that's not full time continuing or that's not this. I think it, it's just showing the evidence of what you're doing is working and the reflection. It, it can be really, really strong. So. And, and I wouldn't shy away from highlighting the challenges of being sessional um, mm. and how you needed to approach things slightly differently. Perhaps the support was different or your timing was different um, that you had to prepare. So I would use those as fodder for showing what you've achieved. And if you'd been, uh, I found my first, my first year, I was jumped around a lot of different subjects, you know, so it's time again, showing how you can translate experiences into a yeah. range of different subjects. Uh, I'm not a one trick, you know, sort of teacher. Yeah. I'm doing a range of different yeah. things and I can respond to the class and I can work out what's going on. And it, it sort of, it does make everything have to have a bit faster evaluation and tweaking the lessons to suit the students you don't know yet. So how do you get to know them? So yeah, yeah, don't be worried about it. it it's, it's definitely, it's great. It's all good. Um, that's one of the things that I really like about this process. It seems to um, almost welcome discussion of challenges and, and, you know, I did something and it didn't work, but did you do something else afterwards? That's great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And there's a question in the chat group about what is the difference between the early career award and a citation? So I can answer that. Basically, you can apply for early career 
either in citations or teaching awards. So in citations, you just have to address one of the four criteria, whereas in teaching awards, you have to address all four. And like I said, the other, if you've gone for the citation before, now you're looking at teaching excellence, you've, you know, it's the other three criteria will be scary because you've already showed that they're, they're the, you know, your strongest one's already been used. And so how do you meet the weaker criteria? But that's, that's the fun of it, I guess. Um, so don't that, that that's normal when you when you do one then it's really hard to get the citation in which is the one criteria and now you've got to address all four. Well, how do I do the other three? But that's that's fun. I that, that that's where you learn a lot. I'm the only uh, tutor here, but I'm applying for um for the citation as a TA. Uh, does it make any difference? So I'm jumping from one unit to another each semester which has um has been already been asked uh it's complicated to stay constant uh i don't know if there's any tips on how to as a ta apply for the citation look i've i've seen applications from people that aren't even teaching they're doing curriculum development in the background and they're working in institutions you know so it's not um it's not just for full time teachers doing that sort of thing. If you are, you know, if you are doing something like approaches, teaching and or support of learning, if you're developing curricula, you know, so you may not as a TA or be doing the development of the curricula, but that's OK. But are you doing assessment practices or part of that role or are you even innovating? So it's if you're enhancing the student experience in the background, that still fits the criteria. So it's, you know, it's outstanding contributions to student learning. It's not teaching and it's not about us and it's not even about the subjects that we're, we're, we're involved in. It's uh, are you making an outstanding contribution to student learning? Um, how is that? And that can definitely be as a TA if you're there. If you're, um, so, I, you know, I mean, even the, the sort of non lecturing tutors in my subject definitely are, have, are going a long way to inspiring and motivating students and bringing in their you know, business or medical expertise in our field. And so it's um yeah not an issue at all just try and work out which of these are you strong in um and how are you helping but remember it it's yeah outstanding contributions to student learning not it's not teaching it's learning yeah i think marco similar to alex i wouldn't be trying to write your application you know in this unit i've done this amazing thing and the students have achieved this and in this unit i've done this amazing thing and the students achieved this i would try and smush that all together and come up with a few key themes and then use each of your units or learning experiences your students had as evidence for the approaches you took as opposed to a you know don't go by unit go by or course go by you know, experience, I suppose, skill. That's actually one of the first first bits of advice I, I, I tend to give a lot. Is this just that like the award is outstanding contributions to student learning. There's a big focus on, you know, you and that sort of and it's like, no, well, how, how does it help that? How does it make that outstanding contribution to student? Keep thinking about that. In the uh, AAUT, we have the uh, mentor scheme here that you can connect with the past teaching awards recipients who have volunteered their time, get in touch with them to develop your applications. And we are mentors on there, by the way. You could choose us, <laughs> but there are plenty <laughs> of other great ones. I yeah. sent my application off to one of the mentors listed on the site and got a huge amount of information. You know, and I remember being quite worried at the time, like, is it confidential? Is it, yeah, it's fine. You just, you know, you can have a bit of a conversation about that and be like, yep, that's fine. So it's, um, I found the mentorship process really, really helpful. And it's when someone else looks at it to realise, you know, oh, you can just add this little line here and make it a much stronger application. I think we both have some other little tips in our videos there as well that we, we linked before. Have a look at those. They're only two minutes each, three minutes. Oh, <laughs> no, mine's a bit longer. Oh, is it? <laughs> I waxed a bit lyrical. Marianne typed a question into the chat box, so I might ask it for her in case she's not not able to unmute. It said, what about learning designers applying for a citation? Um, I think, Christian, you touched on this earlier about, yep. you know, you don't need to be a teacher. You could be in a number of areas as long as you're enhancing student learning. And that can be, I've seen librarians, I've seen learning designers, etc. Yep, exactly that. That's it. That it's, uh, you know, they're, they're called teaching awards, but they're, they're not. They're contribution to learning. So absolutely worth um, looking into and thinking about it. And and that's it. Sometimes you can do a lot more to enhance and inspire, enhance learning, inspire students and just stand at the front and, you know, dictate a lecture. There's a lot more that goes on in the background. Yeah, I think another thing is we talk, you know, the, 
you know, this is certainly about student learning, but something I wrote a lot about in my application was around peer-led professional development. So I established a little community of practice in my school where we were doing little journal clubs about the scholarship of teaching and learning. We were teaching each other how to use new programs and things that were coming in. So by supporting each other, you support student learning. Um, I share my application widely um, and have had lovely feedback from people saying it was great help and I since won mine. Um, that shows my impact later. That's more evidence to add into my portfolio um, into the future. So anything that we can do in this space benefits others, benefits you, benefits the students because we get, you know, a better pool of wonderful teachers to enhance their learning. Yeah, I wonder how um, how we you know, we can sort of look to make it more accessible. That it's, it seems that everyone's welcome. That you know everyone's contributing to learning. So that's. Good advice for the future, I guess, to think about these these award schemes and get the message out that it's for everyone and, and everyone can make a huge contribution of how do you maintain and sustain your energy yeah. and passion? <laughs> That's the Demelza question. I, I just love it. I've got wonderful students who um, tell me wonderful stories and that's why I do it. Look, that I'm looking at a workload document on my other screen at the moment that makes my eyes water. But, you know, knowing that every one of those hours I plug into that template was, you know, meant that a student achieved something personally or professionally. Um, oh, I just get so much joy out of that. Um, you can take then your, how do you maintain your joy, Christian? I also am good at taking leave. That's mm -hmm. one other thing. And then you might need to address Shawgat's question about um, student attendance because you've been mm -hmm. keeping a track of that. Yeah, my one is I, I try and learn a new skill every year. Uh, this year's been photography. I had a goal of making every photo in all of my slides the photos that I've taken myself. Wow. And I've got like the muscle contraction ones. So I've got friends at the gym and I'm getting photos of them. And it's kind of, and I've got little stories for the students. And it's been a way to do something that I, I love. And I can't wait to show the next slide the next week. Um, I've, I, one semester I started with a small little, you know, a couple of seconds of poetry each, each week that was relevant. So I had to go and learn these poems and recite them just for something fun to do yeah. that, and the yeah. students resonate with them. You say to them, look, I just want to try and do something different. Um, so it's little things like that, that that keep me going, that every year I'm learning new skills. And um, so I, I love it. And there's, there's, yeah, little things. So uh, the other one then, what evidence can be used as student attendance? Um, if it's online, you can just track who's there. Uh, we use Blackboard Collaborate. You can copy and paste a list of student attendances and just copy it into a document. Um, or you can just take a screenshot of the attendance of the students that are there. Or if you have a PhD or honours or um, another student that can pop in for five minutes and just write down the list. Um, that's it. So I've got, sometimes I have my tutors that attend my, like they tutor for the subject, they attend the online lectures if we're doing them. And I just ask them, why are you there? Can you write down every student who attends just so I know who's there and who's not? Um, and I tell the students we're doing that. And sometimes I even reach out in, in the smaller classes of 150 and fewer. Um, I sometimes do if students haven't come for three or four weeks, I do reach out and say, is everything all right? Can we catch up? Um, they're shocked that I noticed they weren't there. They start coming to lectures the next week. <laughs> I didn't know you'd notice. So that's sort of interesting as well. But yeah, classroom attendance was just one metric that I use. It may not suit. And like I said, if they're not coming to the classroom, maybe it's showing that your online resources are great. So it's not one or the other. It's just thinking, what are you trying to do? Um, for mine, it's very much that hands on interactive activities that um, if students aren't coming to class, then maybe I'm better providing better online resources and focusing on the live content. So it's just adjusting and, and tweaking it. So yeah, or a fun little, yeah, little PowerPoint or whatnot. I use Kahoot in class or a little polling as well. Um, so just, and that also shows they're interacting. So yeah, they're in the classroom, but they're not just asleep. They're still getting involved. And then, yeah, Zoom stats. So um, I think that's have a really good track point. Yeah, it's not just about whether they've logged in, it's that you're keeping them engaged throughout. Um, online classrooms are tough because of the distraction around the place and trying to get everyone into the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, so anything you can do to keep them focused. And Send me an emoji one, now. This is my one from yeah. yesterday. I've, here's my student enrol signs. <laughs> I still have them sign into class from the role because I like it when they're on campus. Music's great, you know, maximising the breaks. We have a little, like, we do little fun activities in the breaks as well and prepare for them and get used yeah. to them. And that, 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 that keeps that motivation going. I, I can't wait till the next session, but I'm, yeah, I, I like it. 
for them, for them, but also for, <laughs> for me. And it doesn't always work. I mean, I, I, I talk very, not talk that fast, but I do, you know, go relatively quickly through some content. And I've noticed, for example, that um, students that are English as a second language would like me to slow down more when I, you know, so it's, it's our, our teaching doesn't always work for everyone. We're not the yeah. most amazing teachers that suits everything. And so for those students, I know that sometimes I'm a little bit fast, if you can tell from how I talk, which then means I need to provide. So I always provide videos where I go through things slowly, which for most students aren't a thing, but students that might have missed something because they're English. Yeah, so just trying to facilitate that. We don't have to be perfect of everything in every way. We're just trying to work out what our what our weaknesses are and see if we can help students who might benefit from other ways of delivery. The career, I think, is first five years. I might hand over to Angeline for that first uh up to any time in the first five years, um, yeah. but going going back to two years of experience. So you can put more in, of course, which is great, but two years of experience. It's sort of like early careers for teachers with less than five years of uh, teaching experience and the evidence of no less than two years for early career. Last yep. little thing, you just start. Like I said, it took me a year or two to get the evidence together. So start collecting evidence. If you're looking to go for a citation, also look at the Teaching Excellence other criteria and think what else can I start collecting while I'm doing it and so the earlier you start the better it's not something you can decide to write and then just write because you're going to realize oh maybe I should attract the interactions on my little a game or whatever I made in class so yeah the earlier you start the better and apply the awards are fantastic and it's really I'm so glad we have them and it's been a great experience being part of them thank you Christian and um now I'm just going to uh, remind you of the nomination key dates so ICOs will have to register the nominees by Friday 27 of August and the full submissions will have to be uploaded by Friday 17 of September. So from now to then you still have time to put your applications together and work with your ICOs to submit applications. All right, thank you very much everyone. And Bye everyone, all the best. Oh.